And now we would like to introduce little Charlie, who will be three weeks old tomorrow. He's in the middle of eating a meal right now, but he still has ways to go. He thought he would take a little nap in the middle of everything, but we're trying to tell him otherwise. He's got to eat some more. We have to remember that a little baby like him is human. He was created and developed in the womb under the same conditions as the rest of us. He lived and grew in a temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius. He was tube fed through the umbilical cord. He lived in the dark while his eyes developed. <laughs> his blood was oxygenated through the umbilical cord as well, while his pulmonary system developed. Inside the womb, he was prepared for life outside the womb. He slept when he was tired, usually 45 minutes at a stretch. Naturally, he never experienced hunger since he was tube fed around the clock. And he did not have the vaguest inkling of danger. He moved. He used things as soon as he got them. Arms and legs, muscles. He made breathing motions. He sucked when he got hold of the umbilical cord or his own little hand. And he engaged in gymnastics, sometimes so energetically that it was visible to the outside world. When it is time to come out, he shall be born. And to this day, no one knows what exactly causes labor to begin. We know that the baby has to come out, and we know why the baby has to come out. But we don't know the exact location of that tripwire that says, it's time. The baby has to come out in order to survive, because suddenly or gradually the food supply is cut off. The umbilical cord, which links the baby to the placenta, simply starts to shut down the whole process of growth and survival. As a result, the baby that eventually emerges is, I dare say, expecting the worst. Now I'm toast. I'm not going to survive. Out he comes, hungry, half suffocated, which means very little oxygen in the blood. After being rotated through a passage so narrow that the two halves of his skull are subjected to such pressure that they actually may have to overlap. That's why the skull 
is so constructed with a fontanelle where it is. The little person that eventually sees the light of day is naturally in a state of shock. Over the way his very agreeable existence in the womb was terminated. His body has been put through the winger, scrunched up and more or less starved. He finds himself in a world approximately 15 degrees cooler than what he has been used to. He has to breathe to get the necessary oxygen with lungs that have never been used for breathing. He does so, his life depends on it, and exhales with a scream. Thus, his vocal cords are used for the first time. And of course, there is a purpose here. We all know how important it is for a newborn baby to cry. It enables the breathing apparatus to crank into jeer. These cries are something else the baby has never heard before. And how much fun can that be? Our Creator, God, has programmed every little person who is to be born to suck. Suck on anything and everything you can get your hands on because your survival depends on it. God exhorts. And one more thing, he says. Latch on. to the very first people you meet. Because if you try to go it alone, you're done for. You have got to establish something called attachment as soon as possible. And I see to it that the very first people you meet on earth are prepared to guarantee your survival and give you protection. And protection means obviously warmth and clothing, a blanket, all that stuff. Oh yes, you get that. But also literal physical protection. The kind of protection that ensures that you don't fall to the ground. Hi, sweetheart. Wasn't that a smile? Oh, yes, it was. Because if you fall to the ground, and this is something all newborns know, just as they know that they have to suck, if you fall to the ground, it's game over. Either you freeze to death, starve to death or get eaten alive. It's like being on the ground in the forest if you fall out of a tree or whatever you happen to be living in. You're somebody's dinner. That's why I'm holding his little hand with a very steady grip. I'm also holding his head partly to be able to communicate, to hold his gaze, but also to give him a feeling of this literal physical protection 
you won't fall to the ground. I will make sure of that. Oh, how beautiful. And that's why some babies... ...can't stand lying on their backs, even for the brief time it takes to change a diaper. There are babies who start to scream their heads off and are totally convinced that their number is up. I've fallen to the ground. On the other hand, no babies have anything against this. They think it's great. The higher, the better. It's totally fine. Well, of course it is. I assume because I'm standing between the baby and the ground. I don't know. All babies think it's completely okay to swarm around up here. The younger the child, the higher up he likes to be. It's only when babies really learn to move around properly that they like being on the floor and should be on the floor. By that time, they have figured out that the floor and the cold ground in the forest are not the same things. That's why if you put a little baby on his back, which is constantly recommended these days, you're really not doing him a favor. You might think Oh, look at that one, Swan Lake. You may compare a baby to a turtle. That's what I used to do. A turtle lying on his shell has his tender parts exposed. And so has he. He is an easy prey for wild animals. He feels that too. If we happen upon a turtle that is lying on its back and naturally trying to pull in everything that can be pulled in, we turn it over. Immediately. Automatically. Why? Well, because we know that it doesn't stand a chance if it's on its back. It can't move. It can't get out of harm's way. It can't even get food. It can't do anything. Which means it can't survive. We're not dealing with a turtle here, but a human being. But just like, thank you, just like a turtle or a beetle. Oh, there was the bird. Or why not a frog? A human infant has his shell here. Spine, ribs, and they afford a certain amount of protection. It's not quite so easy for the wolf to gobble him up from this side. It is this protection, this so called shell, that I'm strengthening when I place my hand firmly on his back. If I handle him very carefully, anxiously, like this, 
as you tend to do with little newborns because they seem so fragile. He might be very nervous and apprehensive because he will think any minute now I'm going to fall to the ground. That's why we need a firm, confident touch, a touch that strengthens. And observe, it's not here, it's not his bottom, but his shell, so to speak, which I strengthen to give him a feeling that he really is protected from mortal dangers. And by the same token, he's got to feel that he has something to hang on to. Mm -hmm. Well, there is mother's fur or something else, so that he doesn't feel he's in danger of falling to the ground. Oops, we had a little hiccup here. That's no problem. It's not dangerous. Oh, no. As I said, oh, that's not what we want, do we? No, we don't. As I've said, he is a human being, and his little person embodies the development of the human species over millions of years. In him, we can see how we developed from a little tadpole, an embryo with gills and a tail, into the independent thinking entity that walks upright on two legs, that we call a human being. Evolution has taken its course, and this is what it looks like. And he is showing us now. Even a fresh newborn can move, and he does so by wriggling like a snake. If you place a newborn on his mother's stomach, the baby will make his way up to mother's breast. It might take half an hour, but he gets there in the end. And the prerequisite for this is that the baby is lying on his stomach and can wriggle up to the breast. This wouldn't work quite as well, would it? A baby that is placed on his stomach in his bed from day one will wriggle as far as he can and as a rule will scrunch up in the left-hand corner. It's a popular spot. Don't ask me why. Then you can pull the little scamp, as I like to call him, down again and he will repeat the maneuver. Once he has wriggled his way through life for a while, he will begin to slither or creep, or he should begin to creep. That's what a crocodile does. Everything is geared to forward movement, onwards, ever onwards, which can be seen as highly symbolic.
Once he's gotten the hand of creeping, he is programmed to go for crawling on all fours, crosswise, which is how we walk later on. And once he's mastered this art of crawling, he will pull himself up on something. And finally, he lets go of that something and walks on his two legs. If you stop and think how fragile a creature, a human being is, and then consider that it was our species, of all the species on the planet, that managed to subjugate the earth, you realize that certain prerequisites have to be in place if we are to survive and move forward, develop, in other words. I said we were fragile. Think about we are constructed. We would not survive a single night outside, exposed to frost and cold. We have no claws, no fangs. We need weapons to defend ourselves. We cannot store nourishment for any length of time, but have to eat continuously. We would not last more than 72 hours without water. We have no protective fur. We are, at least superficially, less than world-class when it comes to the struggle for survival. It was to protect themselves against wild animals that human beings first built dwellings. We have to have a roof over our heads. And we have to have a door that we can lock so that nothing can sneak in and sink its teeth into us as we lie there with our vulnerable parts exposed. We discovered fire and learned how to use it to keep ourselves warm and we certainly learned to stick together because on our own we are not much to write home about. We still do these things. We have to, if we are to survive. But little babies don't know this. Their starting point is, mortal danger is clear and present. It looms large. I'm going to starve to death. I'm going to suffocate. I'm going to freeze to death. I don't stand a chance. And there is nothing I can do to keep myself alive. By myself, I'm done for. I have to depend on someone else to safeguard my interests in this world and make sure I survive, because there is no way I'm going to make it on my own. And that is why, naturally, all babies are born with what I call survival anxiety. They have an instinct to survive, we all do, and it's the strongest instinct we have. They want to survive, they must survive, they need to survive, but they are convinced that they won't. 
So when they come into this world, they are not full of love for mom, or all curious about dad. They come into this world utterly convinced that they are going to die. So the first commandment for anyone who wants to save this little baby's life is quite simply to save it. Give this baby food. Let him suck as he is programmed to do. Give him warmth and physical protection. Thus, if you want a newborn baby to start to believe that he might actually survive the next few seconds, or even the next five minutes, give him food, lots of food, more food, and then more food after that. Oh, that was cute, wasn't it? Then, of course, there is sleep, safe and sound sleep. It's not only completely unnatural to put little babies on their backs to sleep. They are no more designed for it than turtles are. It's also downright mean, because lying in that position preserves and solidifies a baby's survival anxiety instead of alleviating it. He will sleep, of course. As a rule, babies sleep 45 minutes at a stretch on their backs. That's what they did in the womb. But the survival anxiety will wake them up time after time. I've fallen! I'm lying on the ground! Someone has got to hold me, protect me, make sure I don't fall to the ground again. And you can't allow this to continue if you want to help a little baby to feel secure enough to believe that his survival is assured. In short, to sleep well and long enough. This whole process whereby babies wriggle, creep, crawl on all fours to then pull themselves up stand and then start to walk is not simply a question of motor skills. They don't go through all this just to develop neck strength and such. They have strong necks already. No, all this has to do with brain development and the development of the five senses. Everything is connected. During the various stages of this journey forward and moving forward is the purpose of all this activity. The five senses develop as they should. He was born without ever having used his sight. This sense is not functional yet. The irises have reached their full size which is why babies seem to have such large eyes. But that's all that's finished, so to speak. Neither sight nor the ocular muscles are fully operational, any more than the digestive system or anything else. He has ears, as we can see, but his hearing is not fully developed. His sense of touch is not fully developed either, nor is his sense of taste and smell. All this cranks into jeer when he starts to move around.
And even a one-year-old, who has been allowed to crawl a lot, still doesn't have much in the way of death perception. He thinks he can step out the window and then step back in again. He has no idea that there is a pretty steep drop out there. So, if you are wondering how I got the idea that babies should not only sleep on their stomach, but should actually live on their stomach, you can ask neurologists who study brain development. They are not keen on the flat on your back position. It not only delays and impedes the development of motor skills, but also prevents the five senses from developing the way they were designed to. Now he's having a rest on his stomach. He's in a state of complete calm. If he were left in peace, which isn't going to happen, he would eventually fall asleep. <laughs> Little babies who are allowed to lie on the stomach from day one very rarely develop sleep problems.